We're giving the holdovers a lift while the civil dead are finding self-reliance in a radical dreamer. I'm Van Connor. And I'm Adam Ball, and this is Off Screen, your seven-day guide to everything movies. Boom. Hello and welcome back to the show. So we have got a handful of movies to talk through today that Van has already seen and I haven't. Um, so let's start with, and I'm hoping I'm going to get this pronunciation correct, Werner Herzog, Radical Dreamer. Have you not heard of Werner Herzog before? You sound like someone who's not encountered Werner Herzog. I've read about him, but obviously when mm. you read about him, interpretation is up to yourself. So I know that he is a pioneer of new German cinema and he kind of, you mm. know, he, he, he's quite well known, obviously, for that. But I don't, didn't, never, never heard his name pronounced, so I have no idea if I said it right. But I think we just go with Werner, Her- Werner Herzog, I think is how we say it. But um, if, you've, if you're not really that familiar with Werner Herzog, this documentary is very much for you. So this is new documentary. It is written and directed by, I think it's Thomas von Steinecke. Um, it is a retrospective of you know the life, the influences, uh, the influences of the career of, and just what makes Werner Herzog tick. Um, I say it is more aimed at newcomers than sort of people who have a, a long term familiarity with the man. But uh, have a listen. Well, I believe that he could eat his shoe. That sounds like it probably is true. Is it true? Er inszeniert das Event. Alle Leute auf des Floß und dann runter den Fluss. Let's see what happens. It was life. You know, it's like you bit into like an exquisitely sour and sweet fruit that you never tasted before. That's it. There was one difficulty after the other. Lack of money, technical problems. We had two plane crashes. I live my life, or I end my life with this project. So he was he was well known for a particular style of cinema, wasn't he? I mean, I'm guessing that's part of what you're going to learn from this. Uh, part part of what you're going to learn. I mean, Werner is a very singular director, uh, very much. So. I mean, there's there's a lot said about him here, and it's like I've I've seen my share of retrospectives of, of Werner Herzog. He is so revered that there are just a wealth of documentaries that you will have seen about him. And he's kind of the he's kind of the the, the mad imp figure of, you know, film nerds. It's, it's kind of how we view him. So to put this in context for you, this literally opens with, and you're going to very quickly discover that he has a very singular personality, Adam. This opens with Werner Herzog, I think, driving a car and saying in his very distinct voice, I do not have dreams. The senses, I do not have the traditional sensory dreams. And then goes into his spiel about madcap images and, and hallucinations, effectively, that form his dreams. And then he, he almost immediately afterwards says the line, I pray to remain a good soldier of cinema. And you're like, yeah, Werner's back, baby. It's just it's one of those things where you you don't get any sort of new wisdom from him. But then again... Werner Herzog has never said the same thing aloud twice, so there's always something new, new and increasingly bonkers spewing from the man. He very quickly asserts himself here. Yeah, he goes into his background a little bit more than usual, I think, talking about his absentee dad and why that made him such an oddball, like kind of what makes him quite the uh, the rebel that he is. He's quite a rebellious filmmaker. He comes up with mad ideas. Even if the films aren't good, the ideas behind them are quite mad. And as such, he kind of reasserts himself, in my mind at least, as the sort of Paul Gascoigne of auteurs, if you can imagine that. So he's basically the Gaza of art house filmmakers. You know how insane it was when Gaza showed up with the with the Raoul Moat thing? That's the kind of thing that Werner Herzog would do, you know, metaphorically speak, figuratively speaking. But uh, yeah, you heard the clip where he was eating his shoe because he lost a bet to satisfy it. He cooked, prepared, he prepared, cooked and ate his shoe and filmed it as an art film. It's called Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe. Um... Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, you, you're gonna you're gonna learn some stuff here, and it's gonna you're gonna really want to seek him out. Um, he's quite sort of pop culturally known, as I say. There's a, a famous clip of him being interviewed by Mark Kermode, in which he got shot by a passerby with an air rifle, <laughs> and it broke the skin of him. He had quite a, a you know a nasty wound, and he sort of dismissed it as it is not a significant wound. And uh, incidentally, we are told at one point in this um, by, I think it's director Vin Vendors, um, who, who asks, who else has succeeded in inventing their own accent? 
And that is something we sort of associate with. So you get the clips, you get the Kermode clips, you get the the, the Rick and Morty clip, uh, you get the Simpsons clip. Weirdly, you don't get the American Dad clip, and you get a bevy of interviewees. That's like money for old rope if you know Werner Herzog. But if you don't, you know, it's fascinating enough. And even if you do, it's it's old rope with at least fresh interviewees. And I've got the list right here. So the list of interviewees for this one <laughs> includes director Chloe Zhao of Nomadland and Marvel's Eternals. Um, Robert Pattinson is in there. Carl Weathers, with whom Herzog worked on The Mandalorian, because he appears in The Mandalorian, the very first episode or so, uh, comes out with that great line, I would like to see the baby about, you know, baby yoda and um carl weathers um fascination with herzog by the way because it's very clear that this is all kind of new to him he is it, it's worth the movie on its own he's just bewildered and amused by the existence of the herzog and it's bloody carl weathers what's not to love um you also get to say Vin vendors christian bale and nicole kidman in the mix so there's a bevy of top talent you know uh, spewing their opinions uh, on the man and it's like hey, money for old rope but never uninteresting rope is that everyone who's looking for a new job, by any chance? <laughs> Everyone's thinking, I'll get in on the next one. Yeah, we, I was so disappointed yeah. we didn't get Nicolas Cage, though, because he did direct Nicolas Cage in the, the Bad Lieutenant, uh, Port of Call, New Orleans one, I think, in 2009. No Nicolas Cage, sadly. But, you know, otherwise... Very enjoyable, just nothing particularly new. All right, well, there you go. Werner Herzog, Radical Dreamer, if you want to watch it, it is out in cinemas from today. Uh, let's move on to um, Civil Dead. Now, I watched, the, uh, I watched the trailer to this. I don't know the actor's name, but in the trailer, I thought James Buckley, a.k.a. Jay from The Inbetweeners, was in this movie because he looks exactly like him. I, you know, I, I think I can give you that. So um, I think you want. I think you're on about Whitmer Thomas, actually, who's the uh, the, the supporter. Right. Yeah. So this is um, uh, directed by, co-written by, and starring. Is it Clay, Clay Tatum? I keep going to call him Clay Thomas. Um, you got Whitmer Thomas, who co-wrote this with him. He also stars. So. Clay Tatum plays Clay, imaginatively enough. He is a sort of down-on-his-luck photographer who's moved to L.A. His career hasn't really taken off. Uh, you know, the, the, the next opportunity is just round the corner. It's always slightly out of his out of his grasp. We can all relate, I'm sure. And uh, one day, his, his girlfriend goes out of town. His wife, sorry, goes out of town for, for business or something. And uh, he's left to his own devices. And she makes him promise to go out and actually do some photography work. And and, and he, he does that, but he's soon interrupted by the arrival of an old high school friend who has also journeyed to L.A. as well. And he is sort of setting himself up as, a, as, as an actor. However, his friend, when he asks his friend to leave, like, thanks, I'd like to get on for my day now, his friend, so he's played by uh, Whitmer Thomas, who plays him, I just think his character's name is Wit. So they're really going, you know, it's the, the, the Chuck Lorre school of, of naming characters here. Yeah? Um, his friend tells him, I can't leave you, unfortunately, I'm dead. And you seem to be the only person who can see or hear me. So I kind of, I'm stuck with you. I can't open doors, I can't physically interact with the world. And only you can physically see and hear me. So, uh, sorry, buddy, but you're stuck with me. Have a listen. Hey, I know this is awkward, but I need you to leave. I can't leave. Um, what do you mean by this? What are you saying? What are you telling me? I think I'm dead. I think I'm a dead ghost. Dude, I know this sounds insane. No. Hey, man, let me ask you a question. You I'm can't probably see rambling me. here. <laughs> Sorry. I don't really know what to do with myself. Maybe I'm here to help you, fix you in some way. There's nothing to fix here, man. I'm good. I've been following you around for a week now, man. You're a loser. I love the concept of this, and I always have loved the concept of, like, ghosts and being able to, you know, interact with the, the living. And, I mean, that's why I love, you know, the 80s classic ghost. Um, so is this, is this a good... Is this done well? I mean... You made the comparison there with ghosts straight off the bat, and I would describe this as sort of the mumblecore indie equivalent to that. Now, first of all, it's a very obvious COVID project. Now, I did look into it. It turned out it actually was. Because you can tell with the sort of Spartan presence of people, etc., the way it's laid out. this, And also the way it has access to locations, the way it uses its geography, because it has a lot of like wide open, like, should be populated spaces that are empty. However, it kind of works in the film's favour in that it actually kind of helps sell the idea that, you know, this is a ghost story. Um, and it, yeah, I say, it, it plays. It's not enti- it's not crowd-pleasing by any stretch of the imagination. It is, one, I think, more aimed primarily at the, the mumblecore crowd. 
you know, your Duplass fans and things like that. But I thought, you know, it had enough quirky charm to work. So it, it balanced out for me, like, as a sort of a three-star effort. Not wonderfully directed, not revelatory. The gags aren't really laugh-out-loud funny, and I kind of wish they were. I'm going to say this again about another movie later. But uh, on balance, yeah, it comes out pretty good. Well, if you want to watch it, The Civil Dead, that is out in cinemas from today. In a moment, we're going to look at Kevin Hart's new movie, Lift. We'll see what Van thought of that. Uh, And also we're going to look at Holdovers as well a little bit later. So stay where you are. We'll be back in a minute. Hello and welcome back to the show. We're going to talk about a movie now that if you fancy watching it, you don't even need to leave your living room because it's out on Netflix already. It's the new Kevin Hart movie and it is called Lift. So, I mean, I've read the synopsis to this and I absolutely love how it looks, but how is it in reality? How is it in reality? It doesn't really take off for me, if I'm honest, Adam, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. So, Lift, this is this actually dropped on Netflix um, towards the end of uh, towards the end of last week. Um, so we're only now getting to review it. This stars Kevin Hart, his latest Netflix venture, because he seems to do a lot with uh, with Netflix these days. And uh, he is the leader of a... He's the suave, elegant leader of a band of hustle-style art thieves. Remember the BBC series, Hustle, with Adrian Lester and, and yeah. Donald Vaughan? Yeah, yeah. Imagine that crew working art, art heists. Right. As the movie opens, he is stealing an NFT from Venice. It doesn't make any sense. Just roll with it. Uh, in, a, in a new thriller from F. Gary Gray, who did The Italian Job 2003, so had already done a Let's Open a Movie with a Venice High sequence, you know, 20 years previous to this. Um, they are then cornered by the Interpol agent who is, you know, tasked with tracking them specifically, hunting them down. Only for it to quickly emerge that she's also Kevin Hart's ex-girlfriend. But before she can slap the cuffs on him, Interpol are forced to make a deal with him whereby, for reasons that don't make a lot of sense, he has to hide, he has to board a plane at 30,000 feet and steal half a billion dollars worth of gold on behalf of Interpol, so that they can uh, entrap an international terrorist. Have a listen to the lunacy that is this. This job, I don't know if it's possible. If there's a way to do it, we find it. We need to intercept half a billion dollars. But we're not taking the gold. We're taking the plane? The whole plane? It's kind of hard to take half a plane. Nice. Welcome to the team. They really love you. I mean, what's not the love? You are a thief, a con man, a professional liar. Agree to disagree. This is it. I show them what true artistry looks like. See, I love a good heist movie, but the thing is that annoys me is when you have a heist movie where things are so outrageously impossible to do in real life. Like, Ocean's there Eleven is. is possible. Well, oh, you knew I was going to say yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm with you on that. Right. And, the, I mean, we are skipping ahead, but, yeah, the movie falls apart when they get to the actual heist because then it just becomes lunacy and you're like, what, what's going on here? Right. Let me, let me go through, because I, I did have to articulate my thoughts on this one. I had to actually get my thoughts straight on this one. Because simply turning up and going, uh, average balances out of three stars, didn't really seem to cut it. So it starts out, as I say, it's quite a neat little riff on, on Hustle. And it's got this quite nicely dialed down Kevin Hart performance at its centre, you know, as the, as the, the team leader, as the, the, the Adrian Lester uh, from Hustle. What you then got are the really cringy bits where they try and update it. And the thing with the NFT, for instance, just feels like, oh, God, why? Please stop. Oh, it's like when your dad says, like, cool people terms. It just doesn't work. Um, I say, you've got that opening then, which is, you wonder why F. Gary Gray is doing this, like, again, like, after 20 years. Why are you doing the same exact sequence? And also... Having done that, you should know that this doesn't work with an NFT as the gimmick. And there's loads of little bits like that where they try and make it like with it and bleeding edge. Um, it's politely put, dumb AF. It is idiotic to the nth degree as it starts. And then it very quickly tips over into being so stupid that you just kind of go with it. And about the point that they, they introduce the element, about 10 minutes in, they introduce the element of you know, Gugu and Barter Raw as the Interpol agent. Is Kevin Hart's ex? Like, oh, okay, I see what we're doing here. So this is basically a bit Thomas Crown, a bit, you know, hustle, a little bit Italian job, but dumb. 
Okay, cool. I'm, I see what you're doing with that. The problem is, as I say, you can go along with that to a certain extent, but then it falls into your issue right there. Because like you say, it's not fun when the heist just becomes ludicrous and silly and impossible, right? Yeah, exactly that. 100%. I mean, Ocean's Eleven is, is doable, right? Very cleverly thought out, and you could actually do it. Whereas I find from what you've said on this, I'd be sat there at the heart, ripping it apart, basically. Right, okay. No joke. I was talking about, first of all, it, like, it darts from from sort of like just daft to, I can't really use the word I'm thinking of, um, ludicrous, we shall say, on a dime, <laughs> on an absolute dime. So, I mean, we do get to a stage where, and if you've seen any of the markers before, there's the sequence they love to show where they whip out this, I call it the Tony Stark jet. It's like this baller version of a private plane. And they make a big song and dance out of the fact that it has an LED underside. Right, the underneath, the underneath the plane, the underside is a giant screen, and they make a big point of telling you this, and then it never comes up again, never once. Comes, and you're like, what? What is happening here? What? 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 Like nobody involved in this seems to know how screenwriting works, and yet, and yet, it's a film directed by F. Gary Gray. Which then makes it even more bizarre when every single time the characters are outside or outdoors in direct sunlight, the cinematography has them so overexposed that everybody looks like a ghost. Like, just overly whitened like ghosts. It is absolutely bizarre. I mean, that's before you get to awful CGI and, and set pieces that don't really work. I mean, there's only really two characters in the thing. There's there's Gwen Bartero and Kevin Hart. And they're not really much more than sort of standard Thomas Crown light archetypes. You don't really have a sense at any point as to who the like what what this villain thing is about because he's played by Jean Reno, and you know Jean Reno from uh, from Leon. You ever see Leon with with Jean Reno and, and Natalie Portman? Yeah. <laughs> I know who you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Godzilla. Most people know him for the American Godzilla one, I think. The Ameri- the 1998 Godzilla. He's like the French spy who tries to kill Godzilla, tries to help or kill Godzilla, depending on how you see it. Um, you don't really care about any of these characters. Now, such, you've got two very minorly amusing performances from Billy Magnuson, who you could hear in the trailer, and uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, the kingpin from the Marvelverse. And he's just playing this full tilt, flamboyant, uh, you know, Truman Capote type con man. I'm thinking, I just want to watch an entire movie of this guy. But they do naff all with either of these characters. Like they forget that they have them. And it's symptomatic of this film that just feels like a watered down, overly expensed, made for streaming bit of slop, really. I mean, it very much belongs where it is, which is just dumped directly onto Netflix because. You you would you'd feel short change coming out of the cinema having bought a ticket to this. You'd feel fine about it, like in the moment, but the following morning you are not going to remember a single thing about Lyft. I'll tell you the bit that annoys me the most with what you said then is the whole aeroplane with the LED underside. Like not using that, not using that as part of the plot. I mean, there's so many things they could have done with that. Right? Yeah, it seems like an obvious thing if you're like trying to get on a plane. But like, come on, like. Why would you introduce something that cool, like that significant, and then ex- do exactly naff all with it? But you know, that's 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 for them to deal with. But I say I personally wouldn't recommend this one. <laughs> I say it balances out at a three because the first half of it is kind of dumb enough to charm you. Um, and it's to be honest, it's kind of nice seeing Kevin Hart dial it back a bit. Like, it's actually something vaguely different for it. Okay, well, if you do want to watch it, it isn't going to cost you anything because if you've already got Netflix, you can just watch it on the sofa and then you won't feel like you've wasted money if you don't like it. So um, you can watch it now. Lift, have a look. Let us know what you think, maybe. Comment, give us a comment. We're quite happy with comments and we can give you uh, give you little shouts today as well or, or next time we do, uh, do the show. Now... We've got two left. We are going to look at self-reliance in a moment, uh, and also the holdovers is what we're going to look at next. Um, I'm, I'm still confused whether this is a comedy or not, but we'll find out in a second. And now it's time for a segment we like to call Off Screen Pays the Bills. Hey, Adam. Hey, Van. So, what's going on? Hey, nothing going on but the rent. You know how it is. And so it's a big thanks to our sponsors this week at Factor. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Get ready to kick meal planning stress to the curb with Factor's awesome ready-to-eat meal delivery. No need to deal with grocery stores, prep hassles, or cooking fatigue. Just, Just picture this. 
delicious chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals showing up at your doorstep. We're talking more than 35 meal options every week, from keto to calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. But wait, of course, there is actually more. You can choose from over 55 weekly add-ons to amp up the flavor and the nutrition game. It's the perfect way to rock your resolutions hassle-free. Fact has expanded its menu to include a variety of snacks like breakfast items, smoothies, juices, and more to keep you fueled no matter what's on your busy schedule. Don't fall into the overpriced takeout trap, meanwhile, because Fact is not only more affordable, but also way more delicious. As so I enjoy chef crafted restaurant quality meals that are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, giving you more time for yourselves. Got a special occasion? No problem either. Check out Gourmet Plus for fast and upscale options that are a breeze to enjoy. And when life gets crazy, Factor is your flexible friend. Customize your order every week with plans ranging from 4 to 18 meals, or take a break and reschedule deliveries for whenever you need. And here's the bonus. Factor not only offers quick fixes for busy days, but also supports your goals. Whether it's Protein Plus or Keto, they've got you covered for the new year. No prep, no mess meals that liberate your time from shopping, cooking and clean up. No more wasted hours in the kitchen. It's the one-stop shop for a week of tasty, nutritious eats. Beyond ready-to-eat meals, they've got cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep you energized during hectic times. Time to simplify your meals and supercharge your year. So head on over to factormeals.com slash offscreen50 and use the code offscreen50 to get 50% off. That's code offscreen50 at factormeals.com slash offscreen50. 50 to get 50% off. Thanks again to Factor. And now, back to the show. Hello and welcome back to the show then. Uh, let's crack straight on with our next movie, The Holdovers. Um, I'm trying, as I mentioned a moment ago, to figure out if this is meant to be a comedy or not. And I haven't seen the trailer, so I don't know. I've just read the synopsis. But it looks like the sort of movie that could be a comedy. Oh, do you know what? I'm not going to tell you, and I'm going to see if you can guess from the clip we play in a minute. But I will tell you that it is a 1970s set story. It is set in uh, a New England boarding school, I think just outside of Boston. Uh, over the Christmas break, when you know, when all the pupils have, have you know gone home to their families for Christmas, there's uh, yeah, a certain subset, like a half dozen kids left behind. Who you know, one of them is a foreign exchange student. His parents don't think it's worth him flying back to China, for instance. Um, another one's parents have just gotten you know married, to resp- remarried respectively, and gone off on their honeymoons. And this group falls under the the auspicious care of a curmudgeonly history teacher played by Paul Giamatti who is being punished for having failed a pupil who also happened to be the son of an influential senator. Uh, so this is his punishment, is to stay behind and guard this, this handful of boys. However, when his, light is, his load is lightened by all but one of the group going off on a ski, uh, impromptu ski trip for Christmas, he is left with nothing but the school dinner lady and one remaining pupil uh, under, his, uh, under his care. The dinner lady obviously isn't under his care. She's there of her own volition um, and being paid for the, paid for the privilege. Um, but it becomes about the relationship between the teacher and this one solitary student played by newcomer uh, Dominic Sasser dinner lady and certainly is uh, divine joy so i've got a, i've got a clip for you this is paul giamatti um basically waving goodbye to his class for christmas and giving them their final grades we'll see after this clip if you can guess which genre this might fall into my friend i can tell by your faces that many of you are shocked at the outcome i on the other hand am not because i have had the misfortune of teaching you this semester and even with my Ocular limitations, I witness firsthand your glazed, uncomprehending expressions. Sir, I don't understand. That's glaringly apparent. No, it's... uh, I can't fail this class. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Mr. Coates. I truly believe that you can. I'm supposed to go to Cornell. Unlikely. I would say that's either a bad comedy or a serious drama. It's a dramedy. It sits nicely in between the two. So... It's also a feel-good period piece dramedy, so it falls kind of into the well space of something like Dead Poet Society. Yeah, you, you ever see Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams? You know, yeah. Oh, Captain, my Captain, an absolute classic of the genre, and this actually might rival it if you can believe that. So first of all, yeah, 
It, it's an absolute wow. blast. Like I say, really enjoyable, old-fashioned, quote-unquote, they don't make them like this anymore, kind of feel-good, period, piece, dramedy. And say, it very much will work for the Dead Poet Society crown. Central to that, of course, much like Williams was to Dead Poet Society, is Paul Giamatti in the lead role. And say, it, it's, it's just halfway between Robin Williams in Dead Poets and J.K. Simmons in Whiplash at times. But it's a really wonderful performance, and it is the kind of performance that other actors could have played this role, sure, but nobody else was getting this exact frequency on which Paul Giamatti manages to balance it. And he manages to, 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 to make it sort of hilariously misanthropic, instantly engaging, and kind of just a, a pitch-perfect Giamatti character. And if you know his work through things like uh, Billions, for instance, he, he actually gets to, to, to broaden the comedy out of it. And it fits more into something like his Sideways character, which, you know, this is a reteaming of him and the director of Sideways, Alexander Payne. Um, as well as that, I didn't quite get the, the awards love for Divine Joy. I didn't really do it for me. She's, she's perfectly good. She's pretty good and all. But I, I just didn't come away from this again. That is an Oscar role. Yeah. However... Newcomer Dominic Sessa, uh, this is his first film role, and my God, he knocks it out of the park. Um, just a, a really wonderful use of 70s filmmaking as well, like 70s uh, camera work. And even I Dance and the credits and everything at the beginning are all very rooted in, in the, the 70s setting. You will love this, Adam. I mean, did you, do you, you must have a good, like a feel good teacher movie or two that you like, besides Dead Poets, obviously, there must be one or two you've loved. Oh, blimey, now you're asking. I, I probably couldn't name any, but I mean, I do I do like that sort of style mm. uh, and, and I'm all up for like 70s and 80s kind of retro movies or, or movies yeah. that look back into those decades. Like, I'm all for that. Um, so, I, you know, for what you said, I think I probably would like this, yeah. I think I think you will. I think this is one of those as well. It's also, because it has been noted that the movie's releasing here on you know Friday, January 19th. And it's got held over <laughs> from uh, before Christmas, because it came out like, I think it was late November in the US. And it is, like I say, a Christmas set movie. A big part of the feel of the movie is how cold and crippling that winter is. You know, and it I mean, we watched this on a freezing night, and it really fit. The, you know, you've got the heating blaring and things like that. And it, it, it worked. It had a really perfect, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, because obviously I watched this on an Oscar screener. But honestly, find a nice, warm, cosy cinema this weekend and go and watch The Holdovers. I They did me a favour in one sense by holding this until you know January because it means I'm going to wind up putting this in my, my top ten of the year when we get to the end of this because I will revisit wow. this as we get to the Christmas period. Like because of its setting, I'll revisit it again. People have said it's an instant Christmas classic. Oh, okay, interesting. And it is one of those movies that, you know, if you want to be a smart ass in the pub kind of thing when someone says what's your what's your favourite Christmas movie? This is a decent one, you know, you could you could pitch this. You know, like I I'm usually the guy that's like, Oh, obviously Die Hard or Batman Returns or Iron Man Three is usually my go to. Iron Man Three is my Christmas movie. But I think the holdovers could become some fellow smart asses you know, go-to response, I think, for, like, what what Christmas movie would you recommend? So I would watch it, genuinely. So they basically released it at the wrong time of year, really? Ah, yeah, I know. But then again, never forget that <laughs> Die Hard, a.k.a. the greatest Christmas movie I've ever made, was released in June. So, you know, they don't really think these things through. <laughs> Is the whole of this movie just in the school, by the way, or does it ever exit that kind of facade? <laughs> It is largely in the school, but I think there's uh, there's, there's a, a short sequence, for instance, in which they, they they go on an overnight trip, for instance, I think to to Boston because there's a there is a subplot involving uh, Dominic Sasser's uh, institutionalized father. Um, you also, incidentally, on that front, because I knew I had been told in advance that this actor was in this, and I had I had forgotten. It didn't really ruin the movie for me in a sense, but uh, Tate Donovan is in this movie, and uh, my friend Case Allen and I we celebrate every time Tate Donovan turns up in anything because it's always like Jimmy Cooper, my boy, you know, because we're all OC fans, and uh, you know, Tate Donovan, man, what a G, just and rocking that seventies do. As well, just rocking that that seventies hair and beard in, in a way that only Tate Donovan and his singular stylistic stylistic sense could. 
Oh, amazing. Well, there you go. If you want to watch it, The Holdovers, you can. It is in cinemas from today. And actually, uh, I've got a child-free weekend this weekend. So Ooh. if the cinema is on the list, I will take your advice and um, take the good lady to go and see this if it's uh, if it's something you think we could watch and enjoy as a, as a couple. Um, okay. Let's look at Self-Reliance, our final movie today. Uh, and I'm quite looking forward to hearing about this because I'm a bit of an Anna Kendrick fan. So we'll see what Van thought of this in just a minute. Stay there. Hello and welcome back to the show then. One last ride. Let's look at Self-Reliance, which is the new Anna Kendrick movie. I guess, to me, if you like Squid Games and Anna Kendrick, this movie is right up the street. I, I, I mean, I'm interested in the fact that you target it as an Anna Kendrick movie, because, I mean, she she is in it. She is a... <laughs> She's, she is a primary character in it for a good chunk of its runtime. It's not her movie. It's actually the, I think it's the feature directorial debut of new girl actor Jake Johnson. Uh, I think he's written the script as well. And it's produced by The Lonely Island, which obviously immediately gets my attention. So I love The Lonely Island. I'm a big Andy Samberg guy. Uh, Andy Samberg certainly does turn up in the movie as himself, playing himself as an actor for hire. So... You have uh, you have Jake Johnson, as I say, has also written and directed this, starring as our lead. He is a down on his luck, sort of everyman type, you know, just working a job nine to five. His, his marriage has fallen apart. He, you know, he's just trying to rebuild the shattered embers of his life, like a year or so down the maybe three years later. Um, he is uh, stopped in the street one day by a limousine in which Andy Samberg is riding. And Andy Samberg says, hey, uh, you're, you're this guy. Get in the car. Yeah, come on. And he's like, Andy Samberg, cool. Yeah, okay, of course. Why wouldn't I get in Andy Samberg's limo? He is then taken to a <laughs> where an abandoned warehouse in the middle of nowhere where he is um, told that he is he, maybe he's asked to play a game for a million dollars, which, of course, he accepts. For the next month, assassins will be trying to murder him. And all he has to do is stay alive and he gets the money. However, he does very quickly discover that there is a loophole in this, in the rules of this game, that, that may potentially allow him to survive. Bear in mind, this is a sort of a comedy thriller. I will, I will let the clip explore exactly what that loophole is for you. You have been selected to partake in the biggest reality show in the dark web. There will be people trying to kill you, the hunters. What are you talking about? There's people trying to murder me? Very much so. You will have 30 days to survive. You will only be killed when you are alone. So let me get this straight. You cannot touch me if I'm with someone and then I get a million dollars. What are you doing? What are you doing, man? Why'd you leave my side? I had to take a Why didn't you wake me up and bring me with you? Because I'm taking a Let's play. So yes, he cannot be hurt in any way as long as somebody is around him. A family member, a friend, anyone. As long as he's not on his own, assassins can't kill him. So, you know, it, it then sort of adds a whole other level to this where it becomes like a psychological thing as well about like, you know, the, 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 the mental health side of having to have your family and friends around you all the time. Pretty good idea, right? It's a novel idea. I really like the sound of this for that for, yeah. for that reason. Like I can, I'm already in my head thinking of scenarios in the movie where oh, I need to go to the toilet or the the bathroom, and then suddenly oh, are you going to come as well? You know, I can totally see well, these kind of things happening. Yeah, that's that, and obviously that's the bit in the exact clip. Like I, I, I need, you know, I'm not going to wake you up. I needed to, you know, do my business. <laughs> you, you get this the idea that he has <laughs> to have someone physically in the shower, you know, kind of things like that. Um, and Anna Kendrick, of course, comes into this as another participant in the game, another player of the game. And it's, you know, if someone right. else is playing the same game, why not get them around you kind of thing? And uh, do you know what? A, a, a requisitely quirky Anna Kendrick. This is Anna Kendrick doing that full adorkable kind of character that she does periodically, like uh, I think Table 19, or to a lesser extent, the Pitch Perfect uh, character that she does. Yeah. Kind of like that. This is, this is one of those where she's she's a li- she's a little bit Zoe Deschanel, if we're being honest. Like you could see this, given that it is Jake Johnson having bitten written for Zoe Deschanel. I could imagine that. Um, so I I enjoyed this for the most part. It falls apart for me where it's 
in, in just not being quite as broad or laugh out loud funny in its comedy as it really could be, especially given the talent they've got involved and, and this concept, which is a great concept. But I think it sits awkwardly between the comedy and the thriller and the, dra- the, the dramatic thriller aspects that it just never quite manages to grip you the way it should. Having said that, though, are you familiar with Jake Johnson? I mean, do you watch New Girl at all? Have you ever watched New Girl? No, no, never seen it. Never, ever seen it. Mm. Oh, worth watching. I think they're all on Netflix uh, nowadays. It seems to have found an entire gen- new generation of fans on Netflix, it seems, because it's been about 15 years, I think, since New Girl was a thing. And um, worth watching. If you like a, a sort of that Friends-style background show, then absolutely check it out. And some of the characters are genuinely great in it. Like, uh, you know, I'm Schmitty for life, you know. But uh, I, I just would have expected this to be slightly more broadly comedic. And I think it holds its comedic cards a bit too close to the chest. Um, but like I say, good showcase for Jake Johnson in that regard. It just doesn't quite give him the larger moments that you know he could really excel in. Uh, having said that, this does sit a lot better than Charlie Day's directorial effort recently, the one where he was the silent movie star, which just didn't work. This this actually does work as a better showcase for you know the comedian wanting to become the filmmaker as well as the star. This works better. Having said that, you get Andy Samberg in there. And you just you've distracted me. You've taken me out of this. I kind of love the idea that they have got him playing Andy Sandberg at least. But yeah, so that's self reliance that is out now on Paramount Plus. I think this one came out a few days ago on Paramount Plus. It is worth checking out. I think. It's a bit of a shame they've not managed to do the, the sort of comedic side because I think Anna Kendrick can actually be quite funny, can't she? She's actually quite I, good at that side of things. It has jokes. It has jokes, but they are. I think they're a bit too dry. I think rather than the the bigger laughs. Mm. I mean, I, I will. I would be honest. I watched the TED series this past week, and uh, that has been absolutely <laughs> hilarious. That has been masterfully funny, like painfully funny comedy. But there are episodes of that where I was, I was honestly, I was just gasping for breath. It was that funny. Um, so I mean, my, my comedy sort of meter has been dialed up a bit this week to an extent. I think. Well, as Van just said, if you want to watch Self Reliance, it's out on Paramount Plus uh, already. So um, if you've already got that, it's not going to cost you a penny to go and see it. Um, right, let's have a brief look at next week then, Van. What are we going to look at? So we've got Samsara, which um, I don't know what that's about. Uh, well, I mean, I actually don't, but I can tell you that there is like a 15-minute experimental sequence in the movie because I was warned about this by the publicist when I got the link through. Thanks, Jake. I'm looking forward to tripping on my living room couch. Um, Baghead, I'm not ah. too sure about uh, uh, Jack Dor, I think, is an Irish action thriller. Um, we've also got the uh, the new adaptation of The Colour Purple next week, which is, I think, Oprah's on that as a producer, I think. Or uh, oh no, Obama is that? I think Obama's a producer on it, and then he and then he put it on his best films of the year list that he puts out on Twitter. Did you see this? So he put his own movie. No. On- he did. Every year, I don't know if you're aware that every year <laughs> Obama does a list of all the book, his favourite books of the year, his favourite songs of the year, and his favourite movies of the year. And he releases it through Instagram or Twitter or something. And uh, this year he did the films one and then put his own films on it. So, nice work if you can get it, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. For millions and millions of people on, on social media. Yeah. That's great. I know. And we've then, of course, also got... Why not? Uh, all- Rangers next week as well, which is uh, a possible Oscar contender for, for Andrew Scott, of all people. There is serious talk that Andrew Scott, our very own, may in fact get a, uh, an Oscar for this. I say our very own, he's Irish, isn't he, Andrew Scott? So yeah. I'm, I'm being UK about it, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, big UK about it, I mean, he's one of yeah, our own, you know, it's like Tim Henman. Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, it's just like tennis when Andy Murray becomes uh, com- becomes English when he gets to the final of Wimbledon. Yeah. No, 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 he becomes British, doesn't he? When he's winning, he's British. When he's yeah, well, yeah, it's, yes. that's how it works. Yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it always works. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. All right. Well, some good ones to look forward to uh, next week. That is all we've got time for this week on Offscreen. We will see you next week. Until then, I've been Adam Ball. I've been Van Connor, and we shall return. <laughs>